Good afternoon and welcome to our session on investing in African prosperity. Over the last 16 years, we have focused on different regions of the world. This year, more than ever before in any other conference, we have focused our attention on Africa. And today, we have a group of panelists to bring great insights into the opportunities and challenges in Africa and why we made the decision that we feel today is the time to focus on Africa. Starting on my right, I'd like to introduce Strive Masiwaya, who I will be referring to as Strive on this panel. <laughs> Former Prime Minister Tony Blair, who will be Tony, Bill Gates, uh, no, I got this one. <laughs> His Excellency President Kagame, uh, who has been with us for three or four days, and we've all had a chance to spend time together, and we appreciate that. And, and Rhonda Zogawi, and she, more than anyone on this panel, represents a company that has been uh, in Chevron in Africa for more than 100 years. And we appreciate you joining us, Rhonda, Thank you. from that standpoint. To set the stage for this panel, why are we so focused on Africa? Why are we asking investors to focus on that? Why are we asking philanthropists, governments, companies, et cetera? And I think, as we all know, prosperity is an answer to so many of the world's greatest challenges. And when we focus on prosperity in Africa, you know, it brought me back to a formula that I had written down in 1965 at Berkeley, where essentially prosperity needed access to financial capital, which served as a multiplier effect on human capital, social capital, and real assets. And each of our panelists, in so many ways, has been addressing the issues of human capital, social capital, and building real assets in Africa. And prosperity is coming to Africa. But what exactly does that mean? Where are we going to start? Let's start with human capital. Africa's population today is around 1 billion or about 15% of the world's population. It is projected to be at 25% by the year 2050. Africa is experiencing a youth bulge, greatly due to many of the achievements of the Gates Foundation and others. And its current median age is 20, compared to 45 in Japan, 37 in the United States, 35 in China, 35 worldwide. While fertility rates are dropping, or we could say leveling off, they're still high and among the highest in the world in Sub-Saharan Africa. We hear a lot about education and health initiatives in Africa. Today on the panel, we have the leaders in that area. We can talk about urbanization in Africa. And in 1900, England was the only urbanized country in the world where more than 50% of the country lived in an urban environment. Today, much of the world is, and Africa would be the dominant area of the world in South Asia, that where 50% of the population is not urbanized. Financial capital, it's beginning to move in, but the financial markets, with less than a trillion dollars in value, and in most countries, many countries, less than a billion in value in terms of financial equity markets. Investment inflows into Africa have increased, but they still are relatively low compared to the other parts of the world. And so when you look at growth rates, and you see that in the 10 years between 2000 and 2010, six of the 10 countries with the highest growth rates in the world were in Africa. And when you look at the projections of the IMF and see that seven of the 10 highest projected growth rates in the world are in Africa. It's no surprise that we're focused on this area. 
We're very pleased to welcome His Excellency Paul Kawami, the President of the Republic of Rwanda. There is probably no better example of the potential for Africa than Rwanda. President Kagame, can you open today's discussions by briefly sharing your own story as a refugee from Uganda, as a leader of the RPF, the Rwandanese Patriotic Front, and as president of your country? Thank you, Michael, and the fellow panelists. First of all, I want to appreciate the people here on the panel who are associated in many ways with African story, uh, from Tony Blair, or Bill Gates, and others who have helped in supporting different efforts on the continent, and fellow African from Zimbabwe, the other side, who is part of the story, and Chevron, who are doing all of that. But mine is to show how the turnaround has been made from a hopeless state of my country. Um, 19 years ago, losing a million people and starting from a very low base on everything and picking up the pieces and being able to, to, to rebuild the country. But as I say this, this kind of situation much as it is to the extreme in the case of Rwanda, it mirrors many other stories on the continent where people have had to start from and how the story has changed about Africa. What Africa was 10, 15, 20 years ago is not the same story about the continent. Many countries have made good progress in terms of uh, prosperity and, and other aspects of, of life. But for Rwanda, we are informed in many ways by this tragic situation where from that very low base, low education levels, uh, low health care, or non-existent in terms of uh, the systems that were lacking, lacking in the country, and, and many other uh, aspects of really a poverty-stricken situation and, and, and population that we have had uh, to give hope and change the story from the partnerships that have been put together, whether it is government, companies, philanthropists, and mainly the citizens themselves, how when they have been mobilized and talked to and shown that once they have given basics, they can really do the rest in, in most cases. That's how Rwanda's story has come together, but there is that long history which uh, Michael have mentioned, which probably I, I wouldn't go into the details of because it would be a long story. But what you have mentioned about, say, my own background from a refugee situation. I was a refugee in Uganda for 30 years, and later on, we had uh, to struggle to regain our citizenship to, to our own country. And there are many stories about different people having struggled through this kind of situation, and but for what is important today is where Rwanda is and how we have come from that very hopeless state to one where our country has, uh, for the last 10 years, registered growth of between 7 to 8 percent. And we have seen incomes and wages rise year in, year out. We have seen citizens coming you know, forward and feeling that they own the different processes and participating in those for the better of their lives. And I want to believe that since Rwanda can do this, and if Rwanda can do this, many other African countries can do it as well. And evidently, many other African countries uh, are 
making very significant progress. And the ambition is to deal with, uh, go beyond poverty, solve the problems of poverty, rise to middle income status, say by 2015. And we have seen that out of 54 countries on the continent of Africa, 25 have achieved that or are about to achieve that. So that shows how the story is increasing positive. And um, this is what I wanted to share with the, the different people here in the audience and with their backgrounds. Since there is this partnership, there is, there, there is this partnership that brings together government, the citizens of the country, the philanthropists, and um, the investors, I want them and I would invite them to associate themselves with this kind of story. And it, it has many sides to it that are very positive. First of all, it is a win-win situation for any investment made in Africa, given what Africa provides today. There is good return on that investment. But more importantly, there is high impact made on the people of Africa in terms of improvement of their lives. So I think that coming together is extremely crucial. And, and I would just say uh, the story of Africa is, is a good one, and they need to know it. Uh, and uh, we are here to tell them the story of our continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Bill, you chose to go to Africa a number of years ago with your efforts. Uh, at the Global Conference and the Milken Institute, we've been very focused on the fact that more than 50% of all economic growth in the world can be traced to advances in the biosciences. Um, you, more than anyone else, you and Melinda, took the leadership to focus on can we increase the health and wellness, extend life and improve the quality of life in Africa. What has your experience has been like? How would you relate it to our group today? Well, we've had a great experience uh, partnering with groups in Africa to raise health and improve agricultural productivity. And I'd say those are two of the, the five things that really put a country on a track uh, to be self-sufficient. You've got health, agriculture, governance, education, and infrastructure. And it's a magic mix of those things that uh, Get, get you going. Rwanda is a great example where they've really invested in all of those things. Uh, the health statistics that I know the best have improved a lot there. But we're seeing that pretty broadly in Africa. Uh, there was a dearth of investment. The diseases of, a, of the countries in Africa weren't invested in because there was no market signal that said, hey, if you have a malaria vaccine, you're going to get some uh, large market reward. And so there are a few of these things in terms of the, the bootstrap that it's necessary for some combination of aid and philanthropy to come in and fund that research to get uh, those things going. And you know, we've seen that as we've gotten vaccines out, they've gone from having 20% of all uh, African children die under the age of five, now it's down to 10%. Now that's still 20 times the chance of a uh, a kid in a middle-income or rich country, uh, they're dying. And, and along with those deaths, one thing that's in some ways uh, less visible is the fact that for every kid that dies, there's three that through malnutrition or cerebral malaria or various health things they experience in their first five years, they're not ever developing their brain so that uh, they can fulfill their potential and either for themselves or their country go get educated and, and contribute. And so as you do these health things, uh, they have these positive effects, the death rates, the, the, uh, uh, the capabilities. Also, ironically, or, or surprisingly, you actually do reduce the population growth uh, because people choose to have less kids if they're having uh, their kids grow up in a healthy way. And that means that everything about feeding and educating can be done. So it's a very uh, hopeful story. It's quite a range of where different Akron countries are on this uh, uh, 
uh, getting, unlocking their human potential and getting things right. But overwhelmingly, it's a, a story where a lot are, are leading the way. Uh, and the formula of how you invest in health uh, through aid and philanthropically is very clear today and, and probably more catalytic than anything, uh, which is why it's, it's the full-time thing that I, I spend time on and uh, find it very rewarding. Bill, could you maybe relate what is, were the greatest surprises in this effort? You know, if you think of the two or three from where you start or, or things turn out the way you thought they would. Well, I thought when I got involved that the uh, really high impact stuff would already be taken and that you'd have to go and take things that were lower impact, that some mix of government and philanthropy would come in and already have done them, uh, both in terms of figuring out how to get innovations created, like a malaria vaccine or an AIDS vaccine, and then innovating in how you deliver them. Uh, how you reach all the kids, how you use digital technologies to track some of that, make sure it's there where it needs to be. Uh, the gap was pretty mind-blowing, which was positive in a sense. It meant there was this huge opportunity. Uh, for example, there was a vaccine being given to rich kids who had a one in a thousand chance of dying of this diarrhea uh, and not being given uh, where uh, kids in poor countries literally had a 10% chance of dying. And so, there you just, through volume commitments, through uh, changes in the way it's manufactured to, to get the price down and building up partnerships, you can get that vaccine, it was a, called rotavirus out, and get it uh, to all of Africa. Uh, Rwanda was one of the first to adopt it, but now it's uh, in 60% of Africa. In two years, it'll be in 100%. And so there was, there were some almost miraculously impactful things that were there and available. I hadn't expected that. Uh, and then you can go and see the, the progress. The first time you go, it's a little bit, uh, you know, wakes you up to remind you of the things you take for granted that not everybody can. But then if you, once you're going on a regular basis, particularly to countries like uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, um, that you can see that even on a on a year by year basis, uh, dramatic things are happening. So to par to paraphrase a couple of things, Bill. One, the potential impact is even greater than you thought it would be uh, from that standpoint. And we sometimes forget in the United States these statistics that Bill has given that in 1900, the 20 percent of children below the age of five dying, that was the situation in the United States in 1900, that one out of five died by their fifth birthday. And when Bill talked about diarrhea and issues, the three major causes of death in the United States in 1900 were tuberculosis, diarrhea, and pneumonia. And so, uh, is there anything that surprised you that was better than you thought when you went? Well, the capacity, once the right things get in place, are, are pretty amazing. Uh, Ghana is a good example where, even at a very low level of income, they decided to have a great medical system, get the vaccines out to virtually 100% of the kids. They do it, they get higher coverage rates than the United States gets. Uh, and uh, it's quite an achievement. So once those systems are put in place, they're adopted, they're they're executed extremely well. You know, you see that with cell phone adoption where the right incentives are put in place. Uh, there's a lot of places like Nigeria, South Africa that have incredible educational capacity. That needs to be invested and grown on the continent as a whole, but there's quite a bit. Uh, all these countries, there's people who've left the country that, that are willing to go back and get involved in things there. The person who um, worked at the foundation from Ethiopia got so involved that they created a thing called the Agricultural Transformation Agency, put him in charge of it. And it's been able to get agricultural productivity up by 30% because of various policy changes, a lot of which were being willing to trust the market, getting the infrastructure in place, getting some more capital into it. Uh, and so they are you know, a country that's had to have famine relief many times. Now they'll be a very substantial exporter and they'll have a certainty of the grains, even in the tough part of the country. And so 
the agricultural story there is a miracle. And agriculture is one where both philanthropy and private investment are very, very complementary. The, the, the philanthropy is for the very poorest and for the seeds, creating new seeds. Uh, and that's a place where Africa is very dynamic, although the number of crops that you have to uh, invest in is unusually large. That is, it's not just the big three. There are about 14 crops you've got to, got to get the productivity up on. We sometimes forget in the United States that in 1800, we really had almost 90% of our population in the United States working in agriculture. By 1800, we were down to 40 and one person fed three, and today it's between one and two percent, and each person working in agriculture. So I think, Bill, you've talked about increasing the productivity of agriculture can make a big difference. Rhonda, you represent a company and yourself that's been very active in Africa for a long time. Today we have a number of people that had organizations around the world, also on the philanthropy side, but also on the for-profit side. What are the conditions that Chevron has looked for to make investments on the scale that you do in Africa? And also, in terms of your perspective, how does Africa look to Chevron today versus 10 or 20 years ago? Thanks, Mike. It's a, just an honor to be on this panel with such distinguished leaders that uh, have done so much for the, the continent. Um, and I'm going to start with your second question first, if I may, and if we could pull up our slide to give you a little context of Chevron in Africa. Very important continent for us. We have been there over 100 years, as Mike has said. We operate in um, business interests in 16 countries. Right now, 17% of our production comes from, from Africa, and over the, since 2007, 25 billion of our capital spend uh, we directed into the continent, which features some of the largest construction projects on the continent. And I'm proud to say that over 80% of the Chevron employees that manage our assets there are highly talented Africans. So we have a, a huge, talented workforce that support our business. Um, we recognize there's many challenges still in Africa, but I would say we have never been more confident about the progress that's being made and the prospect for its future. And that's due to a lot of things. It's due to the leadership that's on this panel here, uh, individuals who have been instrumental in promoting peace, stability, development, eradication of disease, and, and good governance. Uh, Mike mentioned the changing landscape of aid, trade, and investment. As more private sector flows, and with the technology and knowledge uh, reaches Africa, the prospect for real economic uh, growth um, be becomes more promising. And as a recent Economist article had mentioned that I read just a few weeks ago, that it's the African people themselves. I mean, we see their potential and their resilience. And they are, they are seeking. They are seeking um, well-being and peace. They are embracing technology and looking for opportunities to better their lives. So from our generational perspective, I agree with, you know, uh, President Kagame, he talked about the last 10 years. I mean, we've been there a generation, but the last 10 years, we have also felt this progress firsthand. And let me give you three examples. The first, with peace, comes social progress. And we experienced in Angola that progress. A turning point, April 4, 2002, a ceasefire declared the end of a 27-year civil war. Four million Angolans were displaced and the country's infrastructure in ruins. I think President Kagame can relate to their plight at that time. <coughs> President de Santos reached out to Chevron and invited us to help rebuild. And we took that offer on. And we joined with USAID, UNDP, and others to uh, form a groundbreaking partnership to, to promote peace through economic development. We helped rebuild agriculture. We started the country's first microcredit bank that now boasts 15 branches. And um, now today in Angola, they are a must, uh, you know, so much more a peaceful and prosperous nation that are no longer relying on emergency aid. So in the last 10 years, point one, we've seen social progress firsthand. Point two, our investments 
are driving industrial progress. Our energy investments can range from five to $10 billion. More and more over the last decade versus the previous one is finding its way into African companies. Simply put, if we are going to serve the world's demand for energy, we just can't invest in resource development. We have to invest in capacity building in the producing countries themselves. And with that, we are raising standards of manufacturing, manufacturing business transparency, and rule of law. So with private capital flows comes all of the advantages of higher standards as well as job creation, skilling a workforce, and economic diversification. So industrialization, we're seeing a change in the last decade. The third, I'm gonna give credit to Tony. I can call Mr. Blair Tony on this panel today, which is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> and and um, 11 years ago in Johannesburg, Prime Minister Blair at the time launched um, an initiative called EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative to drive good governance and standardization into transparency around extractive industry revenue. We've been the longest serving member of that EIT board for the last 10 or 11 years. And now we have 37 countries and over 70 companies signed on and just under a trillion dollars in government revenue from the extractives has been disclosed. This will start to empower citizens of producing countries in uh, informing them about um, resource wealth distribution. So these are big signposts. So, but what, so what we have learned, what we have learned, and getting to now to Mike's second question, if, if I was to take away one learning from our experience and share that with you, if 100 years has taught us anything, it's taught us that investment in Africa is a partnership with Africa. And although naturally we are drawn to the wealth that they possess below ground, our business success depends on the stability and the vitality of these nations above ground. And what do we look for when we want to invest in a country? Getting to Mike's first question, and I'm almost done. Um, of course we want um, safety of operations. We want stable investment frameworks. We want rule of law. We want a capable supply chain. We want all of these things. But by supporting the aspirations of African nations for peace, stability, and prosperity for their people, we actually in turn enhance those necessary conditions for us in these countries. And today, from our point of view, um, geologically speaking, Africa is still an underexplored continent. And, but, but whether you're thinking above ground or below ground, the opportunity is actually immense. And so at this pivotal moment in where these nations are with respect to growth, our best advice to the private sector is support African nations on both fronts. It will be good for your business, it will be good for the people of Africa, and it's gonna be really good for the global economy. Thank you very much, Ron. <clears throat> so Tony, obviously you've been very focused on education, you, but you've also been very focused on government. And how can African nations increase their human capital? If we start with the belief that Nobel Prize winner Gary Becker that's been with us pointed out, if human capital is really ultimately 75% of the real assets of a country, Bill has been very focused on the number one, how do you increase human capital? You increase the quality of life, you increase the length of life, and then you increase education. I know President Kwame has really invested heavily in health and education. I think 15% of your budget went to education from that standpoint. Um, what about government and how have you seen your, your role in Africa over the last decade? Thanks, Mike. I'm, I mean, I am really optimistic about Africa. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure to talk about it, because usually where I, I go, people want to talk to me about either Europe or the Middle East. And so, 
to lighten the mood, uh, I, I then talk about Africa, whether they like it or not, really. Um, <laughs> I, I'm optimistic for many reasons, but let me just pick out one, which is the quality of the young leadership I see emerging now in Africa, in politics, in business, in civic society. And you're seeing it everywhere. And it kind of ties in with what we're, we're trying to do. When I was um, Prime Minister of the, of the UK, we, we at the Glen Eagle Summit in 2005 for the G8, we, um, we agreed a large extra commitment of aid. And that aid has been immensely important, by the way. And particularly when it's been allied uh, in partnership with people like the, the, the Gates Foundation, it really has achieved a, an immense amount. And one of the things, by the way, is really important to understand is that there's been extraordinary progress in dealing with some of the main disease areas in these last, in these last years. And hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved as a result. I mean, hundreds of thousands. And this is where you know, the, the, the contribution of Bill and others is absolutely immense. Having done that as prime minister, I, I learned something else in my interaction with African countries, which was as this new generation of leaders ca came on, they also wanted to have the, a partnership with us in the developed world that was about them taking the destiny of their country into their own hands and moving from a situation where <coughs> they were in a donor-recipient relationship with the developed world to a situation in which it was a partnership between the two. And for this to happen, I identified the quality of governance as absolutely central. In other words, these African countries could get so far, but without a strong improvement in the quality of government, they were always going to be inhibited. And you know, you see from what President Kagame has done in Rwanda, I mean, the quality of that government has made the difference in reducing poverty, creating jobs, reducing a disease, giving people opportunity. Now, there was one other thing, though, that we then wanted to focus on, is that if it had to be a partnership, and if it was about the quality of government, what I wanted to focus on was lots of people talking quite rightly about the need for honesty and transparency in government. As Roe was saying, the, the um, extractive industries transparency initiative was one attempt to deal with that. But I wanted to focus on one of the things I'd actually learned as, as prime minister of a country for 10 years. You see, here's the thing about politics, which, which I found very curious. I thought when I came to power, in, and I was prime minister and sat in Downing Street, that if I sat in the cabinet room and I took a decision, something happened. Yeah. <laughs> and there was this shocking revelation to me after a time that it wasn't like that at all. Um, and that actually a large part of the system was designed to make sure that nothing happened. Um, now, I ended up finding that the toughest thing about government was getting things done. So I didn't want just to focus on government, I wanted to focus on how you make government effective. How do you actually get programs delivered? And what we do now is we work with presidents, like President Kagame, we put a team of people on the ground working alongside the president's team in order to deliver their programs of change. And in simple basic areas, like how do you get the lights on in your capital city? Um, how do you make sure the necessary roads are built for agriculture to be able to prosper? If you've got a healthcare initiative, and maybe you've got the dollars to promote this initiative, but you just don't have the expertise to make the thing work, how do you help them do this? And it's very simple, it's very effective, and it's something we absolutely love doing. And the interesting thing about it is this, that we recruit the teams of people from the outside, and they will go and live and work in the country. And then I will interact with the president of the, of, of the country or, and the ministers that we work with. And you know, I thought at first it would be hard to get people to come. It's not. People love to be part of this um, excitement around the change in a country. And you know, what I would like to do in the future is to take this even further and start in each of these types of areas, getting people who've, you know, not people who've written a paper about it, but people who've done it, and get leading companies in various areas, international companies, 
to say, look, maybe they've got someone in their early 30s, mid 30s, and how about coming and spending a year and actually helping a government deliver a program of change? I mean, there's a fantastic amount that can be done. And you know, one of the other things I learned about government is that you know, I sometimes used to think that I, I get twice as much done with half the number of people, but it, it's, if you have a good, solid team of people around you, it's amazing how much can get done. So that's what we, we focus on um, and try to do. And, and you know, it's, it's um, uh, something that speaks absolutely to, I think, which is the, what I think is the great challenge in Africa now, which is to get these basic things around infrastructure, private sector investment, and the right rules there, um, how you make it clear that once the government's decided something, it actually gets it done. Thank you, Johnny. Strive, we have hundreds of CEOs and business leaders here, men and women from around the world. Uh, many of them uh, got sent to them by friends their $100 trillion Zimbabwe currency. And, you, and you're wondering, how can you do business in a country where they've gone from a dollar to a hundred trillion dollars. Now, I personally strive, I want you to know, made a poor investment. When it got to a hundred billion, I thought, boy, this could be a good investment at a hundred billion. So I bought about a thousand dollars worth at a hundred billion, only to discover in a short period of time it was a hundred trillion. Now, you have been successful in numerous countries. You focused on an area that we have focused on myself over 30 years, and that was the mobile industry, allowing people to communicate. I think, talk about your experience as an entrepreneur, and we know you've been involved with social change and other things, but let's put your running a for-profit company hat on and let people have an understanding of what you've done, the businesses, and the opportunities where you're running a for-profit company, and how did you build a for-profit company that still exists and you still own part of in Zimbabwe? Well, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, yes, I did get paid for service with that uh, trillion dollars. And um, it wasn't enough. <laughs> 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 you know, um, first of all, let me uh, thank you so much for bringing attention to Africa. For many of us, this is the part of the narrative of Africa we've always wanted you to hear. Not that we don't want you to hear other narratives, but it was time that you heard that Africa is open for business and that many of us do normal business in Africa, even for a trillion dollars. You know, I will, you know, I, when I went home to my... That's a trillion Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe dollars, dollars, not yes. US dollars. <laughs> <laughs> when I returned to my homeland, Zimbabwe, as a young engineer in 1984, it had just come out of its war of independence. Uh, we'd had a civil war. I was a young engineer, I was very keen to get on with the development of the country. And I worked for the government. And after a while, I discovered very much like uh, Tony Blair here, even from a different level, that even from up from down there, if you wanted something done, nothing got done up there. <laughs> so it was extremely difficult to, to work in a, in, a, in a state enterprise. So I took the decision to go into business and um, I've told people that I borrowed the equivalent of 75 US dollars and went off and registered a company and started as a construction, started a construction business. So I, I built that over a few years and um, something very interesting I observed one day that in our culture, whenever, you, whenever one of your employees dies, you are required to attend the funeral. And I was beginning to attend a tremendous number of funerals. And that's when I saw the first storm that we faced, which was HIV AIDS, was killing our workers. And many of them 
there was no pension, there was no security. So we started a program for sending their children to school. And that program grew over a period of 20 years, whereby today, at any one time, we send about 48,000 children to school. And that's how we entered the philanthropic space and learned a little bit about what Bill does. Uh, tremendous work that he does. And we do some work with him in agriculture, which is very exciting. I hope we'll talk about that a little later. But you know, as an African entrepreneur, um, I knew very early that I came from a very small country and that if we were to grow, I had to have a global perspective and began to do something which many African entrepreneurs are only now beginning to do, which is to cross borders and go and build businesses in other countries. And it was at a time when, you know, if you arrived at a border and you said, I want to invest, the police picked you up and said, you know, why can't, why, why can't you do it in your own country? Uh, but Africa has changed, and uh, as Tony was saying, you know, the quality of governance on the African continent, as I have observed it, working over a period of 20 years, is remarkable today, given where we started. When Mandela was coming out of prison, only five or six African countries held regular elections. Today, only five or six African countries don't hold regular elections, and believe you me, most of them are in the north. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the governance has improved. And of course, there is room for improvement all the time. You might even say that here. <laughs> so, you know, give us, give us some space. <laughs> we, are in, we are improving the governance. But we are seeing the result of it. You know, moving in African countries, setting up businesses, there are many, many challenges. And hyperinflation was just one of them. Yes, we faced 500 billion percent inflation in Zimbabwe. And as a telecommunications business, we were not allowed to increase our prices without government approval. And the government did not recognize there was hyperinflation. So they didn't approve our tariffs for periods of six months at a time. And that remained throughout the crisis. So we provide a free service to our customers. And today in that country, we have eight million customers. Uh, it's uh, one of the great things about the Zimbabwean economy, of course, is it got rid of the Zimbabwe dollar and trades in US dollars. So we don't, one, of the, one of the challenges we have with a lot of uh, the markets we operate in is actually exchange losses. So one thing you don't get is exchange losses in Zimbabwe. But um, we've, we've built businesses in some 17 African countries, different kinds of businesses, including telecommunications. And really, my counsel to you as entrepreneurs is going to Africa is not exotic. Don't look at it as an exotic thing. It's normal in every single sense. The same sort of decision processes that you need to make in setting up a business anywhere. We have a business in New Zealand today, Bolivia. We make the same kinds of decisions. First of all, you've got to know the place where you're going. Uh, we're talking Africa, but Africa isn't a country. It's a continent. And I know it surprises people sometimes when I say that. There are 54 sovereign countries. And they're as varied in as anything you can imagine. You know, so, you know, somebody, I was, in, I was making a presentation in Holland the other day, and um, the, one of the businessmen got up and said to me, you know, uh, I was, I wanted to do something in South Africa, but um, I've been looking at Kenya, and I've been looking at the statistics. I don't think I can go to South Africa. I said, well, did you know South Africa built a nuclear bomb and dismantled it? And, when, and we haven't told the Iranians yet. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, you, you, it's as varied as that. 
uh, you have very sophisticated, very complex countries. You have countries at different levels of development, different language systems, uh, different types of governance. But if you approach it with the same way you would approach any other market you are going to enter into, looking at issues of human capital, uh, the, the rule of law, very important. It's not the rule of the president, but the rule of law is, is as important in, in setting and establishing your business in those countries as in any, in any, in any other jurisdiction you might go into. So really, uh, Michael, the Africa is very normal. The, the challenges that you will face in establishing businesses are exactly the same as you will face in Latin America, Asia, and it's, the only difference is that there are local issues to take into account. Uh, but if you ask me today, where would I like to invest, Nigeria or Russia? I'm for Nigeria. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Stry. President Kagame, I know you're a student of history. I know you've studied different countries around the world, and obviously the history of Europe is one of wars for a thousand years, conflicts, etc. cetera. Um, how have you taken the lesson of history in your leadership in Rwanda and the leadership in Africa today? Well, um, our history is such that um, it has taught us many lessons. And in a way that has not only informed us, but also put pressure on us to deliver. And as I said earlier on, even though you may have intention to deliver and you understand what needs to be done, there are real issues now of how you go about it. And that requires capacity. So if capacity is lacking, then you have to build it. And in our case, we have approached it by saying, first of all, among the lessons we have learned, when tragedies strike like it happened in our own country, at some point you, are found, you find you are on your own. So you really got to face it. First of all, you got to understand that this is your problem. You got to face it up front if you are going to have people who support you in overcoming the challenges, you have to go to be there doing your best and then the support will come. If you are not doing that, if the support comes at all, it won't make much difference because it won't stay for a long time. So th th this is one of the hard lessons we learned from uh, that history. So we, we have been able to mobilize our own people and made them understand that we need to face the situation ourselves up front as well as attract or invite or accept the support that will be coming only to strengthen us. And, and that's why we, we have been very open to the partnerships that have existed because there are also people out there who not only are driven by gains they may find in, in doing something in, 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 like in our own country, but are also driven by passion and beliefs and that they can do good. And if they are doing good, the people who will benefit from that to be able to stand on their own, then that's uh, everybody to gain. And, and th there is that that is out there. So, and, and really being the student of that history, 
has, in a sense, hardened us in that conviction that there are things we can face and overcome and be able to do ourselves. And then, in fact, we have had to deal with changing the mindset of our own people who historically have been there knowing that there are problems they have and waiting for some do-gooders to come and help them out. And we have had to flip this around. We've said, no, you've got to be there doing something, and then people will come and help. And that change of mindset has been very significant and very helpful, and in fact central to the progress we have seen in the country, because there is a full sense of ownership. There has been a realization that with the effort they have put in, there is progress, and progress has led to more progress. And this is how the country has been on the path uh, and, and rising uh, until this uh, moment. Mr. President, when, when the world saw Mandela leave prison and express no bitterness, you were in exile for a long period of time. You spoke of a million people being killed in a, in a short period of time, but that's a million people out of a population of 10 million. You know, it's, it's amazing to me and amazing to the world when we look at the issues that former Prime Minister Blair had of Ireland fighting each other for centuries. How are you able to build a country where there isn't this hatred or bitterness for what occurred in rebuilding your country? And as we see in the news around the world, these enormous, what we think of as, as atrocities, none more than in your country and other countries in Africa. Where is the forgiveness and the passion to build the country? How have you been able to achieve that? Right. What is true is uh, while South Africa was uh, achieving the best it could have in its own history, we were descending into the worst kind of situation. The same year, the same months almost. So they were overcoming apartheid and we were facing a genocide. So it really happened. There is also that coincidence of history in that way. But as maybe earlier asked, being a student of history, let us take these similarities between the South African situation and what Mandela faced and what we faced in Rwanda. When you have faced injustice to the level we did, some of us, you, you are going to be, if you are a normal person, the last person to really make injustice on others or your own people. So you come out wanting to fight for justice, wanting to show that there is justice, not to have more injustice, because when you have suffered it for so long, there is, there is that uh, that comes into play. So in our case, when we inherited this kind of situation, a divided society that has been made to be so for so many decades, uh, I won't go into the details of the colonial history and so on, but I'm just focused on moving forward. We had, first of all, the tragedy in 1994, the genocide, whether it was the perpetrators or the victims, you can see everyone lost. So you had a country where everybody lost. Even those who killed didn't gain anything in actual fact. So it was easy to say, look, who benefited from this that we faced in 1994? And then the moment everybody registers that we all were losers, then the whole issue was, can we be winners, all of us? Can we then face up front the challenge and, and look at ourselves, however different we may be, and realize that the difference 
the differences we have in our society can be used to a good effect, not necessarily to destroy a nation like it, it did almost in 1994 in my country. And the response has been very positive. You know, when you are there talking to people, engaging them, and they feel they are stakeholders in every process you are carrying out, and they are beneficiaries, you start seeing progress. There's no doubt about it. So in a way, the tragedy we had in Rwanda came with a silver lining in the sense that we, from the total devastation we had, I think everybody had a des had desire to do better, to be a better person, and this went across uh, different levels of, of, of our society, and this is really something we have built on, and it has formed the foundation and the basis for most of the work we are doing, and everyone and feels they are stakeholders, they are treated uh, uh, with equal opportunity, and the, such opportunity is, is availed through the many efforts and partnerships that have emerged. Well, it's amazing what you've accomplished, and I think Tony would agree the rest of the world could learn greatly from your experience and your leadership. Bill, one of the things you said before was it's not just the child that's lost but the fact that the child that's malnutrition and all these issues is going to affect them the rest of their life. Is there anything we could do with the children? I know you love being with children. And uh, is there anything this group we could do today to accelerate your efforts? You know, if the, if the death rate under five is still 20 times other parts in the world, and if there's so many children that their future uh, development, brain development, or uh, want to reach their potential, that we are potentially losing, what could we do to help? And I, and I say that in the collective way. Well, there's several things that are missing still. We need to do more research on uh, these diseases, and so people can get involved in that. There's a lot of vehicles for that. Um, we can take the vaccines there are and make sure they're affordable, uh, that they can get, get out there. And people like UNICEF, uh, Gavi, uh, great organizations that have been created literally in the last 10 years uh, to go do the, those things. There are particular quests that are close at hand. Uh, Carter Center is close to uh, that we've supported a lot close on guinea worm, which is a, a unique uh, parasitic disease. Uh, the world is very close on polio, and that's rotary. Could you, could you expand a little bit on polio? Um, you and I have discussed it, and I think people would be very interested in your initiative from that standpoint. Well, polio's got an amazing history. You know, uh, it goes back thousands of years. Of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had polio. Uh, created the March of Dimes, uh, and the very first vaccine that was funded completely by donations, not the government, uh, was the SALT vaccine. And so in the 50s, it went from being something where uh, you'd have these huge epidemics where kids would be paralyzed, to by the early 60s, the U.S. did not have a single case of polio because the vaccine got used. In 1988, the world said, let's get rid of it globally. Uh, at the time, 360,000 kids were being paralyzed and killed every year. And within 14 years, they had it down to very small numbers. Uh, and now uh, we're down to three countries with less than 300 cases a year. Why don't we just mention the countries? Uh, Nigeria uh, in the north uh, that needs to improve their health system for this. Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So the last three, you know, we're destined to be three tough countries, and that's what we've got. Uh, but uh, we've got a new campaign uh, that we're raising resources for, and that looks like uh, we'll be able to do that. Why don't you talk in detail a little yeah, bit? Yeah, okay. So overall, uh, it's going to take six years and about five and a half billion. Uh, the hope is about 40% would come from philanthropy, 60% uh, from governments. Uh, and so we've got actually about a 
billion and a half left. We're uh, getting there. And what that does is it buys the vaccine, pays the vaccinators, gets people to go out. And if you succeed, then all the billions that are being spent in every country to protect kids, you save all that money and it goes to other health activities. And we're using it in these three countries to build up their health system. So it's, it's not just polio, it's all the other diseases we'll, we'll get at those kids. Um, one of the challenges is getting the parents there to trust that the vaccine really is safe. Uh, there's a lot of uh, incorrect, bad things being said about the vaccines, that it's a Western plot, that it's to sterilize the women involved. There's even been some violence because of that. So we've got to be very clever uh, to, to win. India was viewed as the hardest country, and they have not had a case for uh, two and a half years now. Uh, they, and there's a lot of lessons about how they went out to every hut, and how they got the religious leaders involved that are being applied uh, to these last three countries. So very close. Uh, when we succeed, it'll be the only disease other than smallpox that goes all the way back to the late 1970s that's ever been eradicated. So uh, it's a neat microcosm of, okay, how do you get these health systems up to be uh, really, really good? And then that's this legacy that lets all these children not only survive, but, but thrive. Um, in Nigeria, the president, there is his commitment to this is that if we do this right, it'll save over a million lives just in that one country. Uh, so pretty, pretty big numbers. And uh, uh, even in these tough budget times, it looks like uh, it, it can still get done. Bill, we read in the paper the other day of a person in Pakistan that was killed who was protecting the people disseminating uh, polio. You know, obviously, things like that, I know, break your heart when you read about them. Um, is there anything we, the group could do here besides money, okay? Recognize the five and a half or six billion to eliminate it. Uh, but is there anything else? I'm assuming you've reached out to religious leaders in these countries. Yeah, and the, the big event we had, uh, Tony was there uh, just last week in Abu Dhabi. We actually held it in the Middle East uh, because they become big contributors. Um, about 15% will come out of that region. And they've got the, the trust relationships, both in terms of support they provided economically and that religious connection. So they're you know, very engaged in going up into some of the tough, troubled areas and doing what, what was done with smallpox, where you'll have like a day of tranquility that everybody agrees, look, um, let's let the vaccinators come in for this one day uh, because we all want to avoid children dying, children being paralyzed. And uh, a lot of partners, Aga Khan uh, has been good on this, Red Cross has been super helpful on this. Uh, some of these countries, Rotary actually, uh, has enough members that they can get in there and, and help, help the right things get done. So they're you know, a global partner who's been on this from the very beginning and, and quite phenomenal. That's great, Bill. Obviously, as you know, my father had polio and others. And to see, I think, and I think the general person doesn't really understand that if you can eliminate a disease, at some point you can stop the vaccinations too. So, Rhonda, one of the things you kind of gave us was a little call to action that, that you need and you benefit also from an infrastructure of local business, mm -hmm. local activities. Have, has Chevron been active in training or other things to encourage companies to come to these areas? So if someone wanted to, to go to some of the countries you're active in, is there a way that they could get a briefing or an understanding of your knowledge? Are there partnerships they could go to that would help them so they're not starting at the beginning? Well, we're happy to share. Um, our knowledge about how we conduct business in these countries, particularly about building local capacity, either at the community level or at the industrial level. So there's, there's no issue there. And I've got a lot of colleagues in the room that can take names and numbers, so no problem there. But w when you're looking at that kind of issue in um, th the developing world, and Africa is uh, no different, we really have to partner. I mean, President uh, Kagame mentioned partnering a number of times. Uh, Bill's mentioned it, and, and, um, and Strive. I mean, it's, it's all about partnership. We cannot solve any of these issues alone. So with respect to building capacity in the kind of in the skilled workforce, 
Um, we will do a lot of training, uh, qualification of suppliers, certification, and whether that's in, in the vocational skills, you know, electricians, welders, pipe fitters, those kinds of things. Huge, big training programs. We will partner with our major kind of international suppliers and hold them to expectations to train in-country suppliers. So we pass that training on um, into, into local content. We will partner with academic institutions in country to develop specialized skills, whether that may be uh, in, in subsea technology, so their engineering students get trained. So Mike, we, we kind of um, address the issue and build capacity at multiple levels. And one of the things that we, is important is that you just don't certify them, I guess, to get you through your work. It's, it's really a good practice to certify them to a standard that they can take those skills and serve other industries, other businesses, and that's how the kind of the local economy grows in that regard. Um, that's on the skill side. I, I want to build on Bill's point because it, it gets back to my original point about partnership. Partnerships extend across all aspects uh, in the business. Strive mentioned he was, you, you know, you, you get tired of going to your employee funerals. I mean, we're a US-based company, international IOC, working in Africa and many countries. We also went to many employees' funerals. These issues become your business issues, and you cannot stand back and not get involved. So we, too, had to take on the fight against HIV AIDS um, very, very aggressively in our workforce. And we're proud to say that for nine years in Angola and 12 years in Nigeria, we've not had one reported case of mother-to-child transmission of HIV uh, in our workforce and their families. And so that inspired us. I mean, when you solve this thing in your employee uh, workforce, which if your company's out there in Africa, I mean, that's your first responsibility. Uh, take care of your workforce. And then that empowers you to reach out into your, your community. Now we're joining the UN, PEPFAR, and the Gates Foundation and others to eliminate mother-to-child transmission across three countries in Africa where we operate. So my, my points gets back to even if it's skill building, if it's health, it's all about partnerships and the leverage and scale you can create by working together um, can really start to be felt, I think, um, at a national level. Doing it alone, uh, you just can't have that kind of impact. I want to share one more partnership because it gets to something President Kagame talked about, how uh, the feeling of your people when they feel empowered and ownership of things. We operate in the Niger Delta. It is also a very difficult region that has experienced a lot of civil conflict and violence. And we had to reinvent the way we engage with communities there. And we've been able to do that successfully and really transform that relationship one of trust, one of empowering communities, and one that's focused on development. And through that process, we've created peace for our operations and development kind of possibilities for the people in that region that have not much access to other social service at this time. Um, now we're going into that Niger Delta with an even bigger partnership. Uh, we've committed 50 million. We're leveraging that up to 100 million. 17 other partners have joined that in the Delta to break down the barriers to economic development and the, the things that keep poverty and conflict going. So I think if you're a business out there, one, look to partner, um, and two, take care of your workforce first. And if we all do that, you've, you've, you've addressed a lot of, um, you know, you've, you've addressed a good portion of that population, and then move your programs into the communities uh, and then into the nations. And that's been our experience. Um, and we find that these things actually can have a lot of impact and work. Tony, based on what Bill said, President Kagame, Rona, we have a, Rhonda, we have a lot of lessons to be learned in your efforts in the Middle East. And, and it sounds like we're making more progress in Sub-Saharan Africa than as we read about in the Middle East. The, partnership activities, their challenges that you have in Nigeria and, and the River Delta we've spoken about, and the unbelievable, unbelievable story of Rwanda. And I think that President Kagame, the idea that everyone loses 
at some point. You know, one of the statistics that struck me more than any other, President Kangami, is when you said 90% of the students that leave Rwanda to go to college come back. Just an unbelievable commitment to a country. Uh, do you see the potential in the northern part, as Strive said, in the northern part uh, or the Middle East on some of the progress we're hearing about in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, it's, it's a big challenge, and, and it's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, how, how, you, how you manage to produce good quality government in circumstances where there's divisions, religiously, ethnically, obviously is very, very challenging indeed. But, I mean, overall, uh, you know, I, I, I do actually remain optimistic um, because change is happening. You can see it happening. And, you know, he, here's the thing I think that is really exciting. You can see, for example, an area like infrastructure where, I mean, we work in, in uh, s seven different African countries. Um, and you know, one of their biggest problems is electricity and power, you know, ports, roads, the very basic things. But there's a tremendous amount of energy. Now, if that's the slide about where we work, by the way, you should add Nigeria to that too. Um, but there's a huge amount of energy now going in and commitment into resolving this, 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 this question. And if you can get government that is, you see, what Borka Gami created in Rwanda was when there's stability and there's order, then you can get things done. So infrastructure is one thing that is, that is happening now in Africa and is very exciting. But the other thing, is, as Strive was saying earlier, is there is real opportunity for private sector investors today. And Africa wants that investment. You know, th this is the, in the end, to create lasting prosperity, you need a, a strong, profitable private sector alongside a, a stable and orderly government. So this is what, what, what's happening. And what I would just say to the, the audience, uh, running out of time now, is I think there, there are two ways the business audience here particularly can, can get involved. And the first is um, for the, those of us that are doing work in Africa with governments, they need that capacity and expertise. I mean, it, it, people need to know, you know, they've got the, what we find when we put our teams alongside the presidents, uh, as we did in Rwanda, very quickly, once our team was working with the president's team, the team that he's now got around him, I would have been happy to have had in Downing Street. Great people. Then we've moved to other ministries. You know, so that capacity and, and, and the expertise that can come from the people here in the different sectors is absolutely phenomenal. But the other thing is, come and see and, and come and invest. Because I think if you do so, you will find it Fascinating, exciting, and rewarding, both for your spirit and even for your pocket. Mm. Strive, could you, we have 50 states in the United States. They have a similar language, a similar currency, but they're as diverse in many ways as the states of Africa, et cetera. Um, what, how should one start to invest one but the real question I, I'd like to try, try to suggest to you is that there is so much in that cell phone, okay, that smartphone, and so much potential to recharge from the sun and solar, to bring knowledge of prices and, and marketplaces for food. I know one of the areas that we've had an honor of working with the Gates Foundation is that the fact that the price of food doubles in that last mile bill when you try to get it to the people and, and distribute it. But the knowledge, the fact that the entire world can be accessed from that smartphone as you lay fiber optics, et cetera, in the country today. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about what, where we are in terms of penetration? How are those smartphones, if they exist, being used? Uh, how are you charging them, and what do you think the potential is in Africa for mobile and other services banking via that? Uh, thank you very much. You know, we, going back to the Zimbabwe story, you know, we put a billion dollars into Zimbabwe between, uh, between 2008 and today. In 2008, 
Zimbabwe had a penetration of 14%. Today, we are over 100% of the Zimbabwean people. They are, have a cell phone, so they are carrying more than one. And this has happened across Africa. 20 years ago, 70% of the African people hadn't heard a phone ringing. They hadn't used one. They hadn't heard it ring. Today, more than 70% of the African people own a cell phone. And most of the services are better than what you find in some developed countries. Um, if you take Zimbabwe, for instance, uh, it has a population of, three, of 12 million people. Three million people have smartphones with access to the internet, which is a very high cell phone um, internet penetration. And we are seeing these kind of penetrations happening across Africa. Today, our challenge as an industry, where 700 million people now have cell phones, is actually, what do we do now? Uh, because we, we've got the penetration, and it's a little bit, I imagine, Colgate at some point had to figure out what do we do, everybody can brush their teeth. So we've, we, we've got to reinvent and, uh, our businesses and reimagine the, what we're going to be providing next. And of course, we, a lot of us are focused on services, such as uh, financial inclusion, mobile money services, uh, many of you have heard of services such as M-Pesa in Kenya, which has been incredibly successful. But they are not the only ones, uh, I can assure you. Virtually every operator on the African continent is working with mobile money transfer. Zimbabwe, uh, we started that mobile money service there 18 months ago. 20% of the GDP goes through our mobile money service now. Uh, so you and it's growing at 10% compounded every month. So you, you, we, we already are, many of us are setting up divisions in healthcare, in transport, in education, because we now see our networks as a mediation center, mediation for inclusion. So we are looking at how do we, how do we help farmers get information on crops and information so, uh, uh, when, to, when to plant, how do we provide medical information that people can use. I see in less than five years, you're going to African schools and they will, not, they will be using tablets and cell phones for their curriculum, okay? It may actually be quicker for us to achieve than for you because we don't have the legacy. So a lot of these things we're able to actually leap forward and test uh, because there's nothing else there. So if the kids have, have no books, 240 million children around the world are in school without books. How are we going to get past that? Well, if their parents have cell phones, maybe we can begin to do something. So you, your first question, going back to your first question to, uh, to my colleagues, who I know want to now come and invest in Africa. You do, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you start? You know, Rhonda said something interesting. She used the word over and over again, partnership. You know, we are Africans and we are an African multinational and we're proud of that. And I know Africa very well, but there is no African country we've ever been to where we did not partner with local partners. So the first thing we always do is go and find good local partners. We're not, we don't look for partners to help us go to State House. We look for business partners who can add value. They may not have capital, but they will be able to be sustainable long-term partners for us in our business. So partnership uh, helps you to understand the local environment. Secondly, when we go in, in our business model, we always think in terms of empowerment. Empowerment because sometimes it's not possible for you to create the jobs. But, so you don't have to take on people you don't need to hire. 
But you can have an enlightened self-interest by looking at ways to, as Rhonda was talking about earlier, how do you engage in the community? Maybe you're an oil company, but not everybody can be employed on a rig. But there are things you can do in that community which, is in, which empowers people so that they're not resentful and they feel a part of what you are doing. And that is good business. We educate kids. We have 100 kids in this country at your universities. Not a single one of those is bonded to us to come and work for us. I hope they'll work for you. Uh, but I hope you'll also, when you come, do the same. You've got to empower kids, educate, work in your communities. Women, for instance, are a very important uh, group in Africa. You know, 70% of the food we eat in Africa is produced by women farmers working on, small, on smallholder farms. There are many things you can do to empower. Now, you yourself will not be the people working in Africa. So it's really, if you go back to the question on Zimbabwe, how did we do it? How did we survive 70, uh, 500 billion percent inflation? Simple. We had good people. We had good people on the ground in Zimbabwe, professionals who understood what was going on. They read about every single hyperinflation that ever took place in the world. They understood it. They, they, they brought in experts. We studied what needed to be done, and we did it. And we came out of it a very strong firm. So you, you can go in. My only uh, urge to you is to say, get involved. Strive, get get I your people you, involved, I, and you I get involved. I think you've made the case to get involved. Um, as we wrap up, I, I just want to make a couple points. One, we have five individuals and organizations here that have changed the world. Not just for a billion people in Africa, but the entire world. The opportunities for change, as Bill has pointed out, are significant. The opportunities for economic growth, because of the increase in health and wellness, are there. And the evolution of agriculture that Bill and others have been focused on are significant. This is an area of significant opportunity, not just for Africans, but for investors around the world. And that is why we wanted to focus on Africa. Bill, in closing, could you tell us the story of one or two children you interacted with who maybe touched you more than any other? Well, the, uh, one of the most amazing things was I, I met this girl, Hoshman. This is over actually in India. And she was the last child in India to get polio. Uh, and so it's amazing, you know, even though her life will be very tough, and she's three and you know, she doesn't understand how tough it is to have a handicap in a uh, country like that. You know, now that's done uh, in that country. And we want the same thing in Nigeria, uh, in the world at large. Uh, I think one of the most tragic things is going during the malaria season, and you just see women bringing their children in, sometimes too late, uh, so that even though we have drugs, the death rate uh, is still about 700,000 children a year. And so when you see those mothers, you know, there's really no doubt that they care as much about their children as anyone does. And so we need to step up and, and help them out. Uh, and what we do in health uh, is kind of primary there, but all the things that we've been talking about are gonna uh, recreate the kind of uh, things that, that we take for granted and have made the world so wonderful. Well, I wanna thank our five panelists for joining us, and I want to thank you for what you've done for humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs>